Um, I think that we, I know a lot of people in here, but for those that don't know me, um, Sara Fuentes Soriano, a botanist by profession and by passion. I work here at New Mexico State University and I'm the person in charge of our natural history collection that we call Herbarium. So for those that haven't visited, please stop by. We have a collection that is open for the public, for research, for education purposes. And we are always welcome people that want to see our collections and just even stop by and say hello. So uh, let's start with the sharing now. And as you hear, can everybody see my screen now? Yes, it's working, it's working, right. All right then. So what we are gonna be doing today is talking about the family poesy. Um, I see in the screen everybody, I don't know if everybody sees the, the slide with no problems because I myself see everybody's here and it's kind of obstructing my view there. All right, so the family Poesi, which is a very important family, um, a very interesting group that has been along the history of humanity since we start domesticating crops. So what I'm gonna propose in this talk because of the complexity of the, and the size of this family group is to go over some features that can help us to identify plants if we want to identify them. All right. So let's see what's there. So this is a little outline of what I'm going be talking about today. So I'm going to start trying to tell you why do we grasses matter? Why do we care about them? Then I'm going to go over of another question that is addressing why do we need to identify them? And then we are gonna to try to face our fears. We're gonna to try to go over some of the features that people usually say, okay, I don't wanna learn about that because it's too complicated in this group. But we're gonna be so, uh, learning about some of the morphology of grasses that can be helpful to identify them. And we are gonna start specifically working with vegetative features. In this talk, then, I'm not gonna be talking about reproductive features just because of the time that we have, but I'm gonna be hinting into those at the end of the talk. And if you have any question during the presentation, please stop me and I can just go over some of the clarifications if needed. So, why do classes matter? First of all, this is one of the plant groups that is one of the biggest in the world. It's included in one of the five largest plant families that we have in, on Earth. And it's followed only by Orchidiaceae, the pea family, the coffee family, and the sunflower family. Many people argue that Poaceae is actually along with orchidaceae, that they both are some of the largest families, but I think that the debate is very unclear on that. So we will say that these are the five family groups that are most, the most largest in the world. Poesi then, or the grass family, is very mega diverse and is everywhere. In here, I don't want to bore you about the classification, but this is how we botanists organize the diversity that we see in Poesi. So we have about 12,000 species that are included in 768 genera. And those genera are grouped in some other bigger groups that we call subfamilies and tribes. This plant group is found everywhere, like I mentioned. So it's in, you can find it in every one of the biomes on Earth. They can be in tropical regions, in temperate regions, subarctic regions, arctic regions, in grassland, deserts, and even in the ocean. I don't know if you were aware about that, 
And here you have a picture of one of the grasses that is Soteria is found in the ocean. It's a seagrass. Because it's everywhere, we consider, like I said, uh, a family master of the world. It covers about one third of the all vegetation in the, on, on Earth. So it's uh, very widely distributed and it occupies about 70% of the world's agricultural land. This group is central to the world's agrobiodiversity. So here you see some of the very important plants that we have on the daily basis in our table in construction, materials, clothing, etc. So in the next slides, I'm just gonna show you some of the grasses that we are actually close so closely to in terms of civilization uh, growing. So in America, for example, obviously corn is a staple crop that has been with humanity for centuries, thousands of years. In Asia, rice, of course, is one of the very important staple crops. Weeds and oats are very important in the west of Asia, especially in Israel, Syria, Iraq, Iran. In Central Africa, sorghum is again a very important crop, another grass. And for other civilizations, a very important grass too. Here we have the bamboo eaters that have been associated to grass, to grasses, in this case bamboo, for millions of years. So I hope that with this little intro, I can already convince you that grasses are important. And that that's why, one of the reasons why we should be interested in learning about them and how to identify them. So, so we are just to recap then, these are a very large plant group, it's everywhere, it's all over. Like whenever we turn around, we can see it everywhere. And one of the important things that uh, is, uh, we can do when we are trying to identify grasses is that they can be identifi identifiable all year long with or without flowers, which is one of the, the important things that I'm gonna discuss in this presentation. Also, once you have the little knowledge of morphology that we are gonna, it's not little, but it's so important that we are gonna learn today, you can see how grasses are very well adapted to so many environmental, environmental uh, habitats, and they can be defining many characteristics mm -hmm. of the environment where we live, like what kind of ecological variations do we have on site, what kind of type, soil types, uh, conditions of humidity. So grasses can be indicators of the surroundings where we are living. Also grasses, uh, identifying grasses is important because we have so many non-native species introduced in the new world or so many years ago, as well as native plants, very common plants and very rare plants in this group. So learning how to identify them can be very uh, useful. In New Mexico alone, just to give you a brief um, account you know how many species we have, we have about 417 species. Among them is the state grass that we all know as blue grama of Otelua gracilis, here represented in this image. And we have about 125 genera. In here, I make a collage of a very important genera that we have in the state. About 20 of those are best represented. And in the state, we have a lot of annuals, perennials, native and exotics. And you see in here the percentage of which uh, of these contribu contributors. As you see, grasses, you see, you see the honey here are very small, right? And Right there, start our fear. Oh my gosh, how are we gonna work with the morphology of these grasses, which is what we use to identify them when they are so small. And then also you can see in this picture, the complexity of different structures that we call, or people call seed heads, inf influtescence. 
So these are very important characteristics to identify grasses, but it requires a little bit of work for us to get over every one of the morphology before we are able to actually use these characteristics to identify grasses. So like I said at the beginning of the talk, here, I'm not gonna be addressing the morphology, reproductive morphology that you see in these pictures, but instead I'm gonna be addressing, addressing the vegetative morphology that can be used useful to identify grasses. So before IDing grasses, here's my tips. What do we need? First, we need to be able to recognize and examine a group of vegetative no flower characters of pictures in the grass. Then if you know how to use a little ruler, you are in the post on this right side of your task for identifying grasses. We need to be able to do a little bit of measurements with some lengths of structures that we are gonna discuss in the next slides. And then once you are familiar with that morphology, you should be also getting familiar with identification keys or some guide to identify grasses, which are very high abundant. So yes, it takes some practice to identify grasses, no matter what, if you are using vegetative characters or reproductive characters, but once you get familiar with the basic morphology of a grass, then the process of identification get easier. So like I repeated already several times, grasses are, have a small structures. You can see here a finger as a reference <laughs> and these are the flowering part. This is a part in the leaf. We are gonna see what that means, but they are small. Borderline. Most of the grasses have very small structures. Some of them are really tiny. So what you need is a hand lens to go over and be able to see those features in the, in the grass. As you will see in the rest of the photos that I have in my presentation and diagrams, many of those are magnified many uh, times. Can we get so that? that, really that? Reflects <laughs> that the size of the structures are quite small. So when you think about grasses and when you're gonna be identifying grasses, just make your mind to this. They are small. So you think, need to think small and you need to get in really close approximation to the structures that you are using to identify uh, the specimen, the grass what? specimen. Excuse me, Sarah. Hey, yeah. to hear you. Um, what? I'd just like to <laughs> announce to the whole group that if you're not talking to mute yourself, uh, we're getting out, outside noise. All right. So All right. everybody mute themselves. And there's another little trick. If you want to unmute yourself real quick, just hold down the space bar and your, your microphone will come on and you let it go and it goes off. Yeah, I see that. Um, okay, Sarah. Mute now. All right. So I say that we need hand lenses. This is one of the most important tools that you should have handy when you are gonna take the task of identifying a grass. In this presentation, I included a video that you can find in YouTube where you can see an explanation on how to use hand lenses. You Usually a 10 magnification, 10 times magnification hand lens is enough. There are an assortment of hand lenses in the, out there, but if you just get a simple one with a 10X magnification, that will be enough. If you go to this video, you will see that there is a little bit of a trick on how to go about the use of hand lenses, but it's very simple. Like I said, it's a very good tool to, to have handy a ruler one of those transparent rulers, so you can actually do the measurements that you need required, usually to identify some of the features that we are gonna be knowing, uh, getting to know in this presentation. And again, a key or ID key guide, and we have so many options here. You have a variety to choose from. So in here, I added a few of the guidelines, field guides, keys that you can start using to identify grasses in this area, but also in some other areas in North America in general. And you can even use some tools that are very available in Japan. 
Here, Montana grasses are actually an application that you can buy online and then use your phone. The trick is to identify the characters that they even just make a drawings. They don't make a name. They don't give you a name, just make drawings. So you should be able to identify those characters in the morphology that you're having in front of you. So let's start with the morphology then. So here is just a diagram of the genera morphology of grasses. In this part is a close-up of the vegetative features that we are going to learn today. And in this section, you have the whole plant, the whole grass, right? So let's start by kind of dissecting the morphology of the grass that you have in this diagram. From here, uh-oh. Let's see. In this part, we have the seed head incorrectly called seed head, but let's just go with that term for now. So it's that reproductive part of the grass. And the rest below, the rest of the structures below this area, here to here, are the vegetative features. So we have a stem in the vegetative features, which is the central axis from where you have leaves coming out. And in grasses, we have a leaf morphology that is very unique. And so we are gonna go into that. The stem is divided in sections of bulky areas that we call nodes, right? Then we have the leaf, which has a leaf sheet, a tubular part, portion that is surrounding the stem, and then a leaf blade that comes out of the stem, usually away from it. Then we have some structures in the base of this area from, from where the leaf blade and the sheet separate from the stem and they are mentioned in here. So don't worry about it. Let's just not worry about the terminology. Just kind of situate your mind in the morphology that you have in front of you. The stem, usually it, when it's erect or it's straight, we call it um, a comb. And then from there, you have variations of the stem that can go horizontally along the surface of the soil. Either above, and when they are above, we call that a stolon or underground, and that we call rhizome. Okay. This is the basic morphology. So, what I'm making so much emphasis on this morphology is because we actually have guys that only rely on the vegetative morphology that I, we are gonna learn about in the next slides. Here are a few of the um, literature that you can use to uh, use just vegetative features to identify grasses. So it's less digging. So in this diagram, we don't have any longer the inflorescent part, and instead it's only leaves, stems, and different variations of the stems, okay? Here is a close-up of the leaf. So this is more clear now than for you. You see how the leaf has two portions, this portion that we call the blade, and this portion that is surrounding the stem that we call sheet. And like I said, grasses have nodes, have leaves that have are sheeted, then. that's why we call it sheeted. And then they have in this area, some little structures that we call leaves, right? And again, they have, can have a stolon, so they can have, if they are above the ground, or they can have um, rhizomes if they are under the ground. The stems that are running horizontally under the ground, are called rhizomes. Little protuberant uh, growings from the rhizomes are called killers usually. And depending on how the grass looks like, that's why we call habit, we can define also grass, different types of grasses. So some grasses can have an appearance of a bunch grass, other grasses have the rhizomatous grasses form, or others can have the sod grass form. How are we doing? Are we doing okay? Everybody okay? Following me? Pretty Any good. I, uh, Sarah, yeah. I just had a little question about the term tiller. Okay. I grew wheat 
for many, many years. And we would have uh, a, a stage in the plant of wheat that we call the tiller stage. But wheat's, wheat doesn't have those um, stolons uh, underground though. It's just from, directly from a seed. Yeah. So I guess there could be two meanings for tiller. Yeah, in general, the official term of tiller is when you have a new plant coming out directly from the rhizome. That's the strict definition of a tiller. But many uh, agrostologists, many people that work with grasses just refer to a new grow as a tiller. That's kind of the, the most yeah. widely application when you don't want to be strict in the terminology. That makes sense, thank you. Okay. So now uh, let's pay attention about those eight features that I've been mentioning before more uh, slowly. So let's just start with leaves. And in here, in, because this presentation is gonna be shared with everybody, you will be able to come back and use this kind of a cheat sheet to see what kind of questions you have to ask when you're looking at the different structures. I mark the structures with bold letters so you can actually see, okay, now it's leaves. What do I need to think about leaves? Are the leaves with, uh, how long are they are? Do they have hairs or no? Do they have some prominent, prominently ribs or no? What is the color? Or oh, the young leaf in bud is how is that? Is it folded or is it uh, like a scroll or is just flattened? The sheet, what kind of color, etc. Here are several feet key characteristics that you have to pay attention when you are looking at the different structures that I'm numbering in this cheat sheet, okay? So let's talk about leaf blades, sheets, and nodes. Just to confirm that we know where are we uh, in terms of the constructing the morphology of the grass. So we have the stem. The stem has nodes that we call sometimes knees. And that's kind of important because there are so many other plants that look like grasses, but if they don't have nodes in the stem, then for sure you are not working with a grass. And that's the case of a sage or a brush. So knowing that we have these bulky knees on the stem is quite important. That's one of the key features. Do I have a grass or no? Do I have knees? Yes. Yes, you're working with a grass. Then we have, like I said, the leaves that have a sheet portion here, which is the area that is surrounding the stem, and then the blade. In this area where the blade separates from the sheet, we have the ligule, right? This little membrane thing. And nodes, coming back to nodes, sorry, I mentioned I need to mention that sometimes nodes in grasses can have hair, sometimes they don't have hair, sometimes they change in color. The color can be red, brown, yellow, green, and only the notes. So those are important features for you to pay attention on notes. In terms of the blade, that's when you need to have your ruler handy. Uh, the blades can be quite wide, like in this illustration. They have a name, don't worry about the name, just see the, the, the shape of the leaves. The leaves can have a very narrow width, which we call it like a little hairy thing. And that's typical of some group of grasses, as festucas, for example. They can be very wide. They can be in the middle, right? So this is just an illustration of the variation of the width and length of the blade in grasses. But also the leaves can be either flat or have some level of folding, okay? So in this illustration here, you have the leaf that is quite flat, whereas in here you have the leaf that is no flat, and you cannot see that detail until I show you the cross-section of the leaf there. So the level of flatness on the leaves is quite important too. Some of them can be a little bit rolled, the edges a little bit rolled up or rolled down. And on other cases, like in this uh, sample, the leaves are quite folded. You see that's quite an evident folding. So here is kind of a synthesis of the different conditions that you can have both in the shape of the blade and the different level of folding 
or rolling at the edge of the leaves that you can have in grasses. So paying attention to these features is quite relevant for, to identify some genera, some species in grasses. Questions? So grasses, like many other plants that are in the big group that we call monocots, have um, venation. The veins are rolling in parallel. You can see in them here, those kind of bright river marks in the leaf. But in some grasses, the leaves are quite prominent. And in some others, they are not, right? It's kind of what we call it very prominently reef leaf or a smooth leaf. And if you have some times, my students have questions, is this reef or not? I see the veins, they are running in parallel. Yeah, but if you are questioning yourself on whether or not a blade is rivet or not, it's, it's, the answer is then no, the grass is not reef. When we talk reef, we really see the really marks of those um, um, marks in the leaf, like in this case, okay? Also in the blades of the leaves, you should pay attention when you are identifying grasses on whether or not you have hairs or not. Like in this leaf, you don't have any hairs whatsoever. Whereas in this case, you have a very hairy situation only in the sheet, the position of hairs then also matter. They can be at the edge of the leaf only or all over the leaf or no leaves at all whatsoever. Then the color of the leaf also matters. Mm -hmm. You can see a very, kind of a base bluish color in the leaf, but I see here it's quite green. So the combination of all these details is important to identify um, variation on the leaves. That is important for identification purposes. Here is a case of this situation. And of a, a very good example where we can use a number of characters to identify one very common grass that we call the Kentucky blue grass. The surface is smooth. The actual leaf is folded to this level, very much folded. It's not flat at all. Then at the tip of the blade, you can see like a bowl shaped tip. And if you compare bluegrass with some other all other grasses, like the, fes the fes fescues or festugas, these festugas are so narrow, right? They don't have a very wide blade. Now, let's pay attention in this map. I make you a map in here. This is a cold grass. Remember the, the first diagram that I just showed you? And we are working on this area of the plant in the tips of the vegetative um, parts of this grass. So what are we looking in here? We are looking for youngest leaves and bud, okay? Where they are? They are in the tips of growing areas on the grass. And what we are looking for, we are looking for to see if the blades or the leaves in both are actually kind of roll it, roll like an in a scroll or if they are folded. So I, there. So in this uh, picture here, you have a situation with where the youngest leaf in both is just folded. Whereas in here you have the scroll situation on the leaf in both. All right. Now, coming back to sheets. Now we are talking about this area of the of the grass, the base of the leaf that is surrounding the stem. So we are. What do we need to look in here for? We can look for the color, presence of hairs, of no hairs, things like that. So in this case, for example, uh, the sheet is just green, you don't have any marking that is not able to mention, but in these two species or these two genera, different samples, you have a situation where the sheet actually has some color variations. You have some stripes in there. The stripes in here are distributed all over the sheets in this case, but in this case, it's only in the margin, right? In this case, this all, the sheet is also very hairy, whereas in here it's not hairy. Then the, left, the size of the hairs or trichomes officially, that's the good terminology for plant morphology. The hairs, I'm gonna just use the common terminology 
hair is in hair short, we are seeing hair quite long. Another feature that we have to pay attention when we are looking at sheets is whether or not they are open or closed. What do I mean with that? Sometimes the sheets, as you follow them, are actually completely fused or appear to be fused in the middle when they converge, the blades converge. In other cases, they are overlapping or they are completely open, right? We see that in the real life scenario. Here's the situation where the sheet is completely closed. It's a tubular sheet. It's completely enclosing the stem, right? Here's the extreme, two extremes, where the sheet is actually open. So think about a collar sheet with buttons in this situation, whereas in here is just a, a V-neck jumper on, that you are putting on top of you, where you don't have any other uh, uh, opening in this way. And where are we again? We are in this part, analyzing this part of the grass, All right? Questions? Okay. So now that is when you need your super powerful, um, your super powerful uh, magnifier. Let's see if I can just show you that for now in have a variation and you are gonna help me um, see if this exercise will actually work. Let's see. Let's see, let's see. Is that working? No. Are you seeing um, a microscope view? No. It's not going to work. Well, let me tell you what I was trying to do. Oh, he's there. Oh, he's going to work. Oh, I'm so excited. There you go. Oh, it works. Let me see now. Can you see it then? Yeah? I think that I have to just leave it like that. Sarah, another thing for uh, live pictures like this, it's best to get in the mode on the view uh, as a, a speaker um, uh, view instead of a gallery view. Let's see then, speaker view there. All right, so let's um, do this alive and show you the structures that we are going to be learning about in a little bit. So I have my blade, I'm pulling it out. And when I pull it out, you should be able to see um, here, oh, wait, let's see, there. You see those little fringes, kind of membranous structures, right? Thumbs up, no, this is whitish. You see it? Right. I just stop there. This is too complicated. It looked a little blurry, Sarah. Yeah, let's let's just go with the slides. I think that, that would be easier. That's what I was trying to show you. There. So I was in this area. At least you know where I was. <laughs> so I opened the blade and then I exposed this tissue that we call legios. So again, we are in this area of the plant and is the area where the sheet and the blade separate from the stem. Between the stem, we have this kind of a structure that is very visible in some grasses and some others are not that visible. When we have this situation, you can see like a membranous tissue. In this situation, you have, you just see little hairs. So the shape, the size, the colors of the legumes are quite important to identify some grasses, right? So here is a very hairy situation that we call that ciliate. Don't worry about that, it's just hairy. In other situations like in here, you have a membrane, but look at that, the membrane can have so many shapes. They can be quite big, short, truncated, 
trail at the end or pointy, etc. So paying attention to those kind of uh, variations in the ligules is quite important. In some other groups, you don't have it, like in this one. This is the only genus in New Mexico that doesn't have a ligule. So the ligule can be absent and absence of ligules and can also be important to identify grasses. It's not a common situation, but it can happen. So again, just to come back to our map, where are we? we are, this is the stem, this is the blade. We look, talk about the ligule, that membranous structures, and sometimes in some grasses, we have also some projections away from the base of the ligule that we call oracles. And we call oracles because oracle in, English, in Latin means ear, right? So those ears can be present or not. Not all grasses have oracles, but when they are present, they can also be in different shapes. So in this case, it's, not, it's one of those situations when you don't have it. And here you have it, but look at that. It's almost like a thread that is coming out of the blade. In here is more of a, like a log shape. And in here is more like a little claw. All right. So the stems by themselves can be quite important to identify some uh, genera and species. So in this case, we have a stem that is rounded and all grasses will have usually a stem that is hollow, right? So here you see like in bamboo, it's a very hollow stem, but it's round. No question about it. In some other grasses though, the stem is quite flattened. So you can see how this uh, pinching the stem in here can be quite useful. So if you roll the stem in your fingers, between your fingers and it rolls, it's rounded. If it doesn't roll, then it's flat, right? No question about it. Another character that is important is to recognize whether or not the plant is an annual or a perennial. And this can be sometimes challenging to identify. I have in there a definition on what do you define as an annual plant or a perennial plant. But one of the things that helps me when I'm in the, in the field to recognize whether or not a plant is a perennial annual is the presence of all tissue. So if I see presence of all sheets, leaves and the new growths of new uh, leaves, then that probably is a perennial plant. In the other case, in an annual plant, I will not have that dead tissue uh, uh, available. And what is more important, is an annual plant will have a very, we will grow and die in one year where the perennial plant will last for many years. And then we come back to those features that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk presence of absence of stolons or rhizomes. And again, these two uh, structures are modifications of stems. It's when the stem goes along or horizontally over the surface of the ground. When the stem goes above the ground, like in this case, we call that a stolon, all right? And usually you will have some coloring in the stolon, green, usually green. If the a stem that is down below the ground um, is found, then you have what we call a rhizome. So some plants, some grasses can have both or only one or none of them. So how you can tell whether or not you have a stone or rhizomes presence, just looking at the habit of the plant. So if the plant is creeping, you see that it's kind of little stuff, uh, Batches of grasses coming from one plant connected by these structures, then you have probably presence of, of stolons or rhizomes. On the other side, if you just have a grass that is all tufted coming from one single point, then it, that plant doesn't have stolons or rhizomes. And this is not a morphological feature, but it's an important feature that even apps like this in this uh, electronic guide for identification of grasses. Uh, is, is used, and that's the habitat. Where do you find the grass? Is the ground 
in an open area, in a moist area, in a forest, in a grassy um, uh, alpine or high elevation areas, and what time of the year we are collecting that plant. All those features, what we call phenology and habitat, is quite important to, to identify grasses only with vegetative structures. All right. So where do you go from here? I don't expect from you to remember all the morphology that we just reviewed so far, but what I would like to encourage you is to go out there. I think that once you get the overpass, the fear of I'm um, learning or not grasses, then you are able to say, okay, um, I can go actually to the, to, the, to the outside and try to identify what are the features that I can identify. Like, do I have leaves with hairs or not? Are the colors of the leaf changing? How is the sheet? Is it hairy or not? Is the grass stuffed or creeping? Uh, do we have have a perennial annual, annual. I think that these are very important features to really get familiar with and be comfortable identifying. So there is no other way but practice. That's what I keep telling to all my students. If you want to learn grasses, just uh, go out, grab a grass, and try, try to identify those structures that we just. There, if you want to be in the advanced group of people identifying grasses with more specific structures, then we actually need to go into the reproductive structures of grasses, which can be a little bit of challenging and it requires a little bit more of training. In here, I will show you in a very simple schema the different types of uh, inflorescence or what we call seed heads, uh, just erroneously seed heads anyway. But we have the variations of the different inflorescence. And then the different parts within the inflorescence actually can also be helpful to identify more specific characteristics for some species and general a unit for identification purposes. In here is just an illustration of all those variations of uh, grass inflorescences that we call it the spyglass, don't worry about it, but this is just here an assortment of the different variations of inflorescence that you can find in grasses. And depending on the number of florets, which are these little um, parts that inflorescence has, you can have different types of groups of, of inflorescence. And see, all of these structures are important to identify uh, species within the plant group. So that's all what I have for today. And, uh, we can go over questions. I hope that I didn't go too fast, but if you have any questions and you wanna come back to some specific um, part of, of, of the talk, we can do that. Okay, if you have questions, go ahead and just ask them. No? Recommendation for the best um, book for beginners. All right, let's go back to these ones. Can you, you see that? Yep. I will say that with what we learned today, if you want to come back after the session is over, we are, we are recording this and just kind of go over the morphology, at least those two, um, at least the very, the very first book will be important, will be very basic, and you will have the skills to identify grasses using vegetative structures. Once you have that uh, knowledge very well narrowed down, I will say you can go into the other uh, books that are present in the top of the, the figure here. This application, this app, you can go right now, you are able to recognize some of those variations by looking at the grass, then you are able to actually narrow it down uh, some of the genera that are very common in Montana and New Mexico too. But I will say, if you are interested in grass morphology with veget identify grasses with vegetative structures, this one book in New Mexico will be very good. Anywhere else in North America, you can use some of these other grasses. In the Southwest, this book is also uh, useful. And again, all of them are just working with all the morphology that we went over today in the top. Thank you.
Anyone else? Sorry, could you show that second book again? The first one, New Mexico Grasses, uh -huh. that's uh, apparently no longer in print. No. And so, but you have in front of you here your uh, herbarium curator that has a PDF of these resources. If you are not able to find it, we can provide that to you. You just need to get in touch with me. Sarah, I have a question. Is this yeah. how you learned uh, grasses or have you improved upon uh, the method for learning grasses? I notice that you didn't overwhelm us with the genus and species of all the grasses as examples, which is how I learned it. And I'm wondering how you might have improved on how you were taught grasses. Yeah, so this is a very interesting strategy that I developed this semester actually, because I have to give a mini semester of grass taxonomy, <laughs> eight weeks. So my students needed to learn an eight weeks everything about grasses in New Mexico, which is just, uh, th that was a very challenging uh, request. So my approach was to actually give them, that's why we say in Mexico, teach the fisher to fish, don't give them the fish. So I think that with this morphology, really narrow it down the morphology that we went over now is one of the approaches, my, my best approach, I think, to actually help you to go and use these guides, more advanced guided guides where you know what are the morphology that they are asking you for you to see. And with that strategy, then you can come back to the books and if you want to learn a specific species and all that, then you are in very good shape to actually start recognizing other specific characters that we didn't discuss in this stuff, like the inflorescent morphology, etc. But I will say, even not just for this class, but in any, my other botany classes, that's the way that I learned the best and the fastest thing, at least growing my confidence. Like, I know this is the morphology that I need to see, and I know what are the modifications of that morphology. Now I can really understand what literature like this is telling me that I need to look for. So that's my approach. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but I think that it really helped to, to, to know what are you identifying? What do you need to see when you have an specimen in front of you? Very good. Any other questions from the group? Hearing none, I have something to ask, uh, Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that you uh, gave us an example of, of grass um, books, both New Mexico and Montana. I lived in Montana for over 22 years and <laughs> Montana is grass country, no doubt about it. It's uh, the variety there and the amount of grasses there are just amazing. Um, I didn't learn them all when I was there, though. <laughs> um, but I, as you were talking, I just so happened to have some bamboo uh, that I just cut uh, from bamboo growing here. And all those parts you were talking about, uh, the leaves and the, and the stem and, uh, and so forth, uh, they're so easy to see on a bamboo. No yeah. magnification necessary for this at all. Yeah. Yeah, but I I got a little question though. I've never seen inflorescence on our bamboo. Does bamboo really have a flower? Yeah, but that's one of the perennial grasses that take forever to actually get to maturity and produce flowers. Uh -huh. So that's one of the problems with bamboo. It's a very long-lived grass, and it requires some time to get the, the flower. Period. So. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, but you know, I think that with this, um, if people have interest to actually go into the uh, inflorescent morphology, which is fascinating for me, I really love that part. Uh, we need to have a, a good microscope in front of us, uh, good hands and time to go over the dissections of the structures to see them. There are some 
key features that you can have in your mind, like, oh, this, this has like a Bokeloa gracilis. It has this inflorescence that only have on one side, like a little comb um, in the inflorescence, like a little comb of the flowers. Oh, that's unique. Those Bokeloa, there is no way you can confuse that with something else. So there are some features that just by sight you can really learn to and use to recognize some grasses, but if you want to be more specific and more technical, yeah, you need a little bit more of training on, on under the microscope. And it's fascinating. I, I love to do that, but we need a little bit more of time to learn that. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I saw somebody in ask if there are grasses that are beneficial for Harris Cake Gardens. Uh, well, on purpose, I make, I give you a list on the presentation because uh, uh, these are just natural genera, uh, genera that are distributed in nature in New Mexico. So let's go back to my presentation. There. The list on purpose that I included in here represent a list of genera that occur naturally in this in New Mexico. Many of them are distributed in here uh, in this the southwest, but they also yeah, are distributed in the northwest of New Mexico. Within each one of these genera, you have a number of species that grow perfectly well in this area. So learning to uh, recognize the genera and then go into each one of these genera to identify some of the grasses uh, that can be uh, used for periscape will be my, my advice. Um, well, that will be one of my advice to you. I also put in here some pictures of some grasses that we don't like at all, like these three here, these are weeds, mm -hmm. but they are really some of the grasses that uh, we can also find in this area abundantly. However, it's only one species or not, not too many. So. These grasses here, um, cheat grass, uh, um, what is the name of this? Synchros, but I don't know the common name. Um, Sandbur. That's Sandbur, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. The windmill grasses. They the are windmill. All over. They will grow everywhere. And heavy escape, and I will not recommend those for sure, but they will do well in these arid areas. But other than that, I mean, here you have a number of groups that you can really use. Uh, purposes of the cultural uh, landscape. I have declared war on sandbirds. I grew, <laughs> I grew up with them in Minnesota and I couldn't believe they're, st they're down here too. Yeah, they are so, they are weeds. So they adapt very well to any environment. Okay, what's the one just to the left of sandbirds? I see that's so common. Is that an orchard grass maybe? This will be an aerograstis here. Genus, oh, okay. This will be Poa, Poteloa, Sporobolus. I think this is Mullenberga, I'm not sure. Or maybe a Limus. Yeah. And uh, I have a favorite grass. It's a higher Chloe, it's, it's a high elevation grass. And when you pull the inflorescence out and eat it, it tastes like nutmeg and sugar. It's so good. And I always thought chefs should know about higher Chloe, uh, but I was curious, do you have a favorite grass? My favorite by far are the Buteloas. I just love that morphology on those grasses. You know, they, they have such a unique inflorescence uh, structure. I just love it. And it's one of the largest genera. It's everywhere in Mexico is quite abundant too. I think that Mexico is one of the centers of or distribution or, or variation of that genus. You know? So that's one of my favorite. But you know, now that I thought uh, um, grass taxonomy, I have so many. It's so difficult to tell them up, uh, to tell which one is my favorite. I just love them. I love them. Um, I just started being like be very afraid of them. I, said, I don't want to go over there. I don't want to learn them. But now that I actually taught them, it's like, oh, wow, this is fascinating. Yeah, they become your children. Exactly. <laughs> what was you. the what was that favorite one of yours again? Uh, the Good genus. Oh, oh. I was asking Sarah, but Joan too. <laughs> My mine is called the genus was high.
Higher, H-I-E-R, Chloe, C-H-L-O-E. And it's a, I think it's called a sweet grass. But Sarah, go ahead. Uteloa, what would be the common name? Uh, blue, the grammas. Grammas. Oh, yes, the grammas. Black and yes. blue and yes. side oats and yes. so on. Yes. I have to agree. Uh, they're yeah, my favorites know, too. I didn't mention that, but yeah, John, you are pointing out to one feature that people frequently don't pay attention on grasses, and that's the smells and flavors. You mm -hmm. know, we pay attention when we have in our on our table. Sugar is a grass. We pay attention about that. Corn is a grass. We pay attention about that. Sorghum, whatever. But in nature, we don't pay attention about those features. And yeah, there are grasses that have very nice uh, smells and unique to a particular group or another. Flavors too, of course. I got to mention one other grass that I got very fond of, and I only got to see it like this once. Uh, in the 70s, when it rained in Montana, there's this um, green needle grass. And together with uh, needle and thread grass, I had a, a high um, pickup truck. Uh, how you say it's it's raised up off the ground quite a bit, and I I could reach out at that time one year only, and reach out from the window and just rub the inflorescence uh, with my hand as I drove along. It was so large and so beautiful. I know, I know. Anybody else? All right, then um, just remember if you want to see more grasses and learn more about grasses, if any of you just want to just see the vari va variation that we have in the herbarium, of course, we can make a tour for you guys, a tour to know her uh, grasses of New Mexico. Why not? That sounds like a good tour. Yes, I agree. <laughs> <clears throat> so hearing no more comments or questions, I guess we can call the meeting to an end. Yeah.